This is a small Louisiana universe. <laughs> misinformation. Definition, like the sure. symposium is using, sure. because otherwise this can mean a lot of different things. Sure. Sure. Uh, and the answer was no. <laughs> no, we have no, we have no definition. Yeah. I'm using the most lo loaded term there is, propaganda. So I'm just, like, just going to go with propaganda. Yeah, I would get people to say that. That'll wake them up. Slumber. <laughs> yeah, well, we're going to get like 20 percent. <laughs> Everyone's going to be a scratch that because we agreed they get the first right of questions yes. and then I'll turn to you if you have questions for each other. Oh, okay. just because oh. we got to ask questions of them, we're going to look at the questions of them. Yeah, too late to change. You already lost. <laughs> Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back. Um, thank you for joining us for the final substantive panel of the symposium. We're joined today um, by our panelists to talk about social media, corporate responsibility, and ethics. Um, so this morning, we probed some of the problems around disinformation. Um, this turns to what is it that we are to do, um, specifically the platforms that are controlling our content. Um, so we've got a panel of experts here with experience in this area to join us and help us to unpack some of the questions. Um, by way of background, it used to be in the, so in the human rights space, we thought primarily about government actors and the ways in which our governments can um, censor us or violate our rights in other ways. Increasingly, there's an appreciation that private actors can also have a substantial impact on human rights, whether those are adverse or basically amplifying the enjoyment of human rights. And when we think about freedom of expression and privacy, this industry sector is central to ultimately what it means to meaningfully enjoy that right in this time. So we are joined today um, first by Evelyn Oswald, and she will... Evelyn is the director of the Center for International Business and Human Rights and professor of law and Herman G. Kaiser Chair in International Law at the University of Oklahoma College of Law. Um, prior to entering the Legal Academy, she was for 14 years an attorney in the Legal Bureau at the U.S. Department of State and most recently the head of the Office for Human Rights and Refugees. At the State Department, she advised senior officials on a wide range of international human rights law matters, including internet freedom and issues at the intersection of international business and human rights. Um, next, we will hear from Andrew Morshina. I should have... No, it's, very, it's very close. I apologize. Uh, no, no, no worries at all. Moshirnia. Moshirnia. Yeah. Um, who is a senior lecturer at Monash University in business law and taxation. He's a graduate of Harvard Law School, where he was a staff writer for the Berkman Center's Digital Media Law Project. And he clerked in Chicago, my hometown, for Judge Richard Cudahy. That was the connection I was looking for. Um, we clerked on the same district court um, maybe a decade apart, if not more. But in any event, um, he then um, clerked on the Seventh Circuit and in Los Angeles for Judge uh, Mariana Pfizer um, and the district court in the District Court of California. 
So he has taught telecommunications, copyright law, international intellectual property law in schools in the United States and in Australia. He also has a PhD in education technology. Um, so he has, um, a tech, he's the voice of technology on this panel, as well as law and policy. Um, next, outside of the Legal Academy, we're joined by two experts. The first is Jason Pilemarriott. He is the policy director of Global Network Initiative, um, also a former State Department lawyer. But currently, with the Global Network Initiative, he is developing policy. The Global Network Initiative is a corporate, non-governmental, academic, and investor uh, multi-stakeholder initiative. This means it brings together different stakeholders to design and develop policy and engage with um, policymakers in governments. And ideally, they, they are working towards enhancing protections for freedom of expression and privacy globally um, and the information communications technology sector. Um, he was special advisor of the State Department when he was there, and he also led internet freedom um, and worked in the business and human rights section in the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. His law degree is from Yale, and he's an adjunct professor at Georgetown University's Master of Science in Foreign Policy program. Um, and then finally, we are joined by Rebecca McKinnon, um, who has straddled the profession, the academy, um, the policy-making world, and is an innovator in, um, frankly, what I think is shaping much of the policy in this space. She is the founding director and current director of Ranking Digital Rights. This is a project that puts out a corporate accountability index that assesses the um, compliance with human rights, norms of privacy, and free speech. Um, she was the University of California Free Speech and Civic Engagement Fellow. She's the author of an important book that I recommend to you all, The Consent of the Networked. Um, this was published in 2002, and I think in the early stages of this conversation starting around governance um, of the public sphere and private institutions. She's a founding member of the Global Network Initiative. Um, she was on the board of the Committee to Protect Journalists, and for years she was CNN's bureau chief in Beijing, so she saw up close and personal some of the human rights impacts of um, suppression of expression. She has taught at the University of Hong Kong the, and the University of Pennsylvania. She's held fellowships at Harvard, Princeton, and the Open Society Foundation. Um, our first speaker will be Evelyn. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you to the Utah Law Review uh, students for hosting us, Professor George and Professor Anderson Jones. It's been a pleasure meeting uh, your larger community and being hosted in such a beautiful facility today and participating in such a timely symposium. As the social media companies that we've been discussing today are global platforms, I thought it would be helpful to discuss their corporate responsibility um, through the lens of global business and human rights frameworks. So today I wanted to do two things. Um, first, I wanted to discuss the leading UN business and human rights framework for companies generally, how it works, what it is. And then the second thing is apply it to the context of corporate, uh, corporations, platforms, um, tackling disinformation. <coughs> So the first question, what are the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, which I'll refer to as the UNGPs? I have to admit, in the early 2000s when I was at the State Department, we were grappling with what do we do with these large multinational actors that are having these adverse human rights impacts on individuals throughout the world. International human rights law was formed for and geared towards state action. Obviously, companies are not state actors. After many years of negotiations at the UN, lots of hand-wringing and some gray hairs, um, in 2011, uh, at the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva, the UNGPs were adopted. And I would like to just drop an oral footnote to say, the US government was on the council at the time and endorsed them and has since on several occasions encouraged American companies to treat these, the UNGPs as a floor and not as a ceiling so a minimum standard in their business operations. So let's unpack what the UNGPs do, what they mean. And maybe I'll start by saying what they don't mean first. They do not apply international human rights law wholesale and directly to companies. But what they do specify is that companies, must, um, companies have a responsibility to respect international human rights wherever they operate even if the local governments are not respecting those human rights. The UNGPs further um, break down that responsibility to respect into two prongs. 
First, companies must seek to avoid uh, infringing the human rights of others. And second, they must address the adverse human rights impacts that they have. So let's think about that seeking to avoid prong when it comes to social media companies tackling disinformation. They're going to have at least two angles that you need to think about. First, is the platform cooperating with governmental requests or laws to tackle disinformation when those laws or requests don't meet international human rights standards? And second, are the platforms by their own business choices, their own business models, their own uh, corporate speech codes infringing on human rights when tackling disinformation? To avoid infringing on human rights, the UN guiding principles give a lot of guidance on what companies should be thinking about and doing, from having human rights policies to having appropriate staffing within their companies of people who are international human rights law experts to having a, a process to engage in human rights due diligence, right, where they think ahead of time before launching a, a product or a business model about how that might uh, influence or impact human rights. And they're expected to engage with external stakeholders when they do that. And when they see that there's going to be a problem, a human rights problem on the horizon, they're supposed to develop strategies to avoid assisting or exacerbating those problems. I'd like to drop another oral footnote here. The UNGPs are pegged to international or UN human rights standards, not regional human rights standards. International human rights standards often differ from regional human rights standards, which in particular frequently provide fewer protections, for example, for freedom of speech. So it's very important to understand that the call of the UN and the call of the US government is to follow these international UN standards in this regard. So when we're looking at social media companies tackling disinformation, obviously one of the salient human rights that are, will be affected will be freedom of expression. Um, so it's important to unpack what is that standard under international law. The key standard comes from the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which I'll refer to as the ICCPR, and it's Article 19. And this article is written quite beautifully. It protects the right to seek, receive, and impart information of all kinds, regardless of frontiers, and through any media. It does, however, give states the discretion to limit speech when they can meet a three-part test. And that three-part test is a one-strike-you're-out test. Okay, so here's the three-part test. The first prong is known as the legality test. And it says, uh, essentially, the restriction must be provided by law, which means a variety of things, but usually the focus is, is the law unduly vague, right? Uh, does it give appropriate notice to those being regulated? Does it give those uh, implementing the law too much discretion? So that's the first prong. The second prong is a legitimacy test. The restriction on speech must be imposed for a legitimate listed public interest objective, such as the reputations of others, national security, public security, etc. And you can't invoke one of those terms as a pretext to secretly protect the regime in power, for example. And the third test is the necessity test, which means the restriction must be, among other things, the least intrusive means of achieving the legitimate <coughs> objective. And that boils down to three logical questions a state has to ask itself. Does it have good governance ways of achieving that legitimate end without infringing on speech at all? If so, don't restrict the speech. If you can't do that, then are you choosing on your continuum of options the least intrusive measure? Are you choosing criminal sanctions when you could have civil sanctions, for example? You have to think through that. And third, are you monitoring continually if the restriction is effective or counterproductive? Um, if it's counterproductive or ineffective, it's an illegitimate restriction on speech. Two other protections that come into play from the international regime are you cannot restrict speech in a, in a discriminatory manner. And I would also note the international regime does have some mandatory bans on hateful speech, but those are subject to this three-pronged test that I just discussed which limits them significantly. Now, when I discuss that test, the three-pronged test, those of you who are First Amendment scholars might hear echoes from the First Amendment. 
And this may be because Eleanor Roosevelt was our rock star negotiator negotiating that text. Um, so there are enormous echoes and, um, and uh, connections to U.S. Uh, jurisprudence that come in through this international text. So question two, how do we think about applying these guiding principles and the ICCPR standard in the context of social media companies and disinformation? As we noted previously, the first side of the coin is going to be, is a company aiding and abetting, assisting another government in implementing disinformation uh, strategies or laws that violate human rights? And what I wanted to raise today in this regard is that we're seeing a very disturbing trend of fake news laws being adopted throughout the world. Freedom House reports that between June 2017 and May 2018, 17 countries approved and or proposed laws to, fate, to fight fake news, which are being used to actually consolidate governmental power over information on the internet. So a recent example I wanted to highlight comes uh, from Singapore, a law that went into a force this month, um, and it's, it's called the Protection from Online Falsehoods and Manipulation Act of 2019. And here are some of the things that it criminalizes. It is illegal to share false statements of fact when that information is likely to be prejudicial to Singapore's security, tranquility, friendly relations with other nations, or likely to incite feelings of ill will. This can trigger a fine of $50,000 or five years in prison. Government authorities, particularly individual ministers, can order a person to take down a post or to order a, connect, a correction be placed near their post. Violations of this order can incur penalties of $20,000 or 12 months in jail. And the governments can order the platforms to similarly issue corrections or take down speech. It will come as no surprise to you that NGOs, Human Rights Watch, and others have criticized these laws, as has the UN's top expert for freedom of expression, David Kay. In his letter to the government of Singapore, he went through the three-pronged test, criticizing these laws as vague, overbroad, having disproportionate penalties, and being troublesome because the executive branch ministers can issue these um, takedowns without going through a judge. So what are social media companies supposed to do if they want to apply the UNGPs? The UNGPs do not require the companies to violate local law, but it does require them to know that there is a discrepancy between local law and international standards and to show what they are doing to not aid and abet violations of the law, of international human rights standards. So the types of things they could be doing is actively challenging these orders in court, right? That will be something to watch for. Will these platforms go into courts in Singapore and actively have a strategy of, of, of litigating these orders? Will they interpret the orders as narrowly as possible? And will they have proactive strategies to address the inevitable adverse impacts that will happen to dissidents and journalists under this law? As an oral footnote, I would note that this, these types of laws are being adopted also in democratic countries. For example, Canada has recently updated its Elections Act, and Michael Carnicolas of Yale's Information Society Project has a very interesting article on, on this uh, new law or amendment to the law in Canada. And I just want to read a little uh, quote from his op-ed piece on this. He says, now, in other words, Canadians had better be careful before they claim a particular po politician is a socialist or is part of the alt-right, since getting a statement like that wrong could lead to up to five years in prison. Because in, under this law, you cannot say something false about a candidate's membership in a group. So, the other side of the coin that we had discussed these companies must be proactively assessing whether their own policies to tackle disinformation infringe on international freedom of expression rights as well. So they need to run their policies, their proposed plans through that ICCPR Article 19 tripartite test, right? That means looking at the legality test. Are they coming up with vague rules? That would be a problem as we've discussed. Um, in looking at the necessity test, the least intrusive means test, they have to ask themselves those three questions. Are there good governance measures that we could implement that could tackle disinformation without infringing on speech? Some of that could be the media and digital literacy stuff we were talking about earlier today. 
Some of it is taking a hard look at their own architecture and business models to see if they have things that make people more susceptible to disinformation and that amplifies it. Um, if they have undertaken those good governance measures, they then need to ask them, and that's not enough, they need to ask themselves, what is our, what are our, what's our continuum of options, <coughs> and are we selecting the least intrusive means? Um, so I think EFF had a very interesting post recently about censorship is not the only way to tackle disinformation. Look at your amplification machines uh, as well. And the third question they have to ask themselves is, are the means selected effective or counterproductive? And if they're ineffective or counterproductive, they need to go back to the drawing board. Um, as I conclude my remarks, I would just make a plea that we consider discussing all the issues we've been discussing through this framework, the UNGPs, which the U.S. government has called on, gover on uh, all companies, all American companies to consider. I think the framework has the benefit of pinning what they're doing to globally ac accepted standards for business and human rights, globally accepted norms, for example, on freedom of expression, and it gives us a framework within which to ask the right questions and to make smart decisions on very complex issues. Happy to answer any questions at the end of the panel. Thank you. Um, and next we will hear from Andrew, who does have <laughs> slides. That I do. Okay. And we're happy, except it's progressing automatically. Anyone want to help the guy who's supposed to be in charge of tech? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I knew the moment, just so you know, the moment it was mentioned, like the tech guy, I was like, the moment I come up, it's going like, to burst into flames. I just wanted to... Next, give me this clicker. Oh, this clicker. Oh, yeah. The decoy clicker worked, down. everyone. <laughs> down here, like, oh, down oh, okay. here, quicker. Down here. <laughs> now we're happy. All right. Well, thank you so much. I asked to please be allowed to stand because I flew from Australia uh, to come here, so my feet represent watermelons at this point. Um, to prove that I came from Australia, uh, this is apparently the home of the Utes. And in Australia, we have Utes, but those are cars that have pickups in the back instead of seats. So just so you know, I'm going to take a picture, I'm going to head back to Australia, and they're going to say, this is the home of the trucks, and people will be really happy. All right, so I do give you a warning. Uh, I'm, I'm going to basically deconstruct how uh, mimetic warfare works. So there's going to be a little bit of uh, disturbing images in here. I won't show you any pictures of death, but there will be a little bit of blood. I'll warn you before you see it. Okay. So. The theme, of this, uh, the theme of this conference so far has really been talking about, well, what's the next attack? Okay, we want to be prepared to fight the next war, not the current war. What's the next attack? So let's proceed with some basic, uh, some basic suppositions. That social media has much misinformation on it. I don't feel that we need to prove out this point. It's true. Okay. There are many proposed models to fix this. You've already heard several of them. Uh, Andy was gracious enough to talk about some of the, some of the steps that uh, Facebook is undertaking. Um, fact checking is a key component to most, but not all, uh, proposed models. As we just heard, some proposed models could be throwing someone in jail for five years uh, for saying the wrong thing. Uh, probably fact checking is better. But with all that in mind, then we should expect the next attack to be on undermining fact checking. Okay? If fact checking is going to be the barrier that, that prevents misinformation from achieving its goal, assume that propagandists will attack uh, fact checking. So just to define some terms, when I talk about a meme, all I'm talking about is a cultural container of information. Okay, that's all a meme is. Okay? A knock-knock joke is a meme. Okay? Knock-knock, who's there? You already know what the sequence of events are. Okay? All a meme in this case means is going to be a programmatic way of repeating misinformation over and over. And the type that I'm most interested in, the type that I'm most afraid of, okay, uh, has two components. One, it's a genuine photo. Okay? You've heard a lot about deep fakes and the idea of like, well, deep fakes are coming and they're going to be so bad. I think we're already in the so bad era 
because you can take a genuine photo or a genuine piece of media and just frame it with a false caption and it becomes a weaponized meme. So blood, sorry. For the example, okay, this is a weaponized meme uh, that made the rounds of both Facebook and Twitter and Instagram with uh, an amazing uh, uh, frequency in the demonization of the migrant caravan of 2018. Okay, just to read this, this is a, a posting by Jeannie Thomas, the, uh, the wife of Justice Thomas. And uh, she writes, the media won't share this, will they? It's an invasion, and thank God for President Trump. Uh, other memes make it much more clear that she's intimating that this is a uh, federal Mexican officer that was injured uh, by the migrant caravan. Uh, this picture has nothing to do with migrant caravan. This, this picture was taken in 2011, but simply by showing you a genuine photo, it's not photoshopped, it's a real photo, and lying about what it's about, I can repeat this over and over. So there's a different sort of, sort of dichotomy of different media that can be altered. So let me just take you through, and as a fun case study, let's look at attacks on American congresswomen. Because I don't know why, for whatever reason, they might seem to have lots of attacks directed at them. Okay? So, um, as an example of a legitimate piece of media, and for the purposes of time, I won't play the media for you, uh, there is a video of Congresswoman Omar dancing. She's dancing. Okay. Um, incidentally, when I've given previous talks like this, I've always made a joke that as someone of Middle Eastern descent, whenever I go to a wedding and people are taking photos, I ask that they hold up a newspaper to show that it's not 9-11. Okay? And this usually gets a laugh, and I'm glad that it did, except that would have been really good advice for Congresswoman Omar. Because what happened, uh, a comedian, I put as many quotations around that word as possible, um, Terrence K. Williams, uh, authored a post that said, this is Congresswoman Omar dancing on the anniversary of 9-11. Okay? And, uh, you know, President Trump was bashed for playing golf on MLK Day, but it's okay for Omar to party? Okay, hashtag, oh, and Omar must go. Okay, um, this, this video is not from 9-11. Okay, this, this video uh, is from the 13th of September. Uh, but it was amplified by President Trump, and even after it was debunked as not having occurred on 9-11, uh, the president invited uh, Terrence Williams. This is now his, his uh, biopic. Uh, congrats to him. Okay. You could also uh, alter media. So, for example, you're familiar with uh, the two videos creating uh, either a drunken slur or a stammer of uh, Speaker Pelosi. Okay, again, not going to rehash this. This was pretty much in the news. So here's an example of where you take uh, legitimate media, you just alter it a little bit. You say, oh, well, she's drunk, and it gets repeated ad nauseum. Okay? However, you could just uh, outright fabricate media. Okay? Uh, here, is Congre here is a purported tweet uh, by Congresswoman Omar. Uh, they reap what they sow, hashtag Notre Dame, implying that she was happy that the Notre Dame fires occurred. Uh, she obviously never tweeted this. Okay, this is just made up. I've you know, stamped fake on it. You know, don't be confused. However, a very, very common meme that was going around immediately after the fires. And as the last one sort of going down this dichotomy is just fabricated claims, okay, where you just take a, essentially a picture of block text, you do this so that it's a little bit harder for algorithms to identify the words, and you just state bunk. Uh, I've put two on here, but let's just focus on the one on the right. Uh, for AOC, who also comes in, uh, Congresswoman Cortez, who comes in for a lot of abuse, uh, that she has been evicted several times, has had uh, warrants out for her arrest, and a credit score of 430. None of these statements are true, and yet uh, you'll see them repeated, again, ad nauseum. So why does all this matter? Well, demonizing people makes it easier for uh, unstable individuals to want to murder them. And also the idea of demonizing a whole people is usually a predicate for genocide. Uh, as we saw uh, the radio stations in Rwanda, current actions going on now in Myanmar. So we, we can understand that this is very important. So we have a heightened need for fact checking. But there are problems, and there are threats ongoing right now to fact-checking. Now, I've kind of di I've divvied these up as internal and external, and I want to focus on external because I think that's where the action is going to be in the next 12 months. Uh, but for completeness, I'll also talk about the internal threats. Okay? So the first is the idea of false equivalence. And the idea of false equivalence is that media fact-checkers may want to uh, deflect possible claims of bias 
by detecting, quote unquote, equally false statements uh, across multiple political actors. Okay, so for example, uh, the Washington Post uh, awarded three Pinocchios, itself something problematic, why can't we just call a lie a lie? Uh, three oopsie goofs to, uh, to Bernie Sanders because he made the statement that uh, half a million medical bankruptcies occur a year. He based this on uh, a study that the uh, fact checker didn't think was sufficiently rigorous and for this awarded three Pinocchios. Uh, President Trump has on multiple occasions noted that <clears throat> tens of miles of new wall uh, is already been constructed and more will be, so will be done as soon as well. An obviously false statement that is not true. These were awarded the same number of Pinocchios. So there's some false equivalence, what about ism that's going to creep in. On the same side of that coin, again, this fear of bias is that there can be political pushback. So even when a uh, fact check is done thoroughly, uh, political actors can intercede to get that fact check delayed. And as we've heard from other speakers, latency is a huge issue. Okay, the longer it takes for you to throw the water on the fire, the faster the fire can, the further the fire can spread. So for example, in fact checking a claim, the claim that was made that abortion is never medically necessary, regardless of your feelings about abortion, this statement is not true. Okay, the statement was debunked. Um, uh, Facebook took steps in, in line with their policies when something is found to be untrue. For, uh, for, uh, political actors, four senators, sent a letter basically claiming bias, and Facebook agreed to delay in its actions uh, in order to assess whether or not the fact check was in sel itself valid. So again, if we see the political actors know that they can increase the, viral uh, the, the viral spread of a meme merely by claiming bias, they're going to do that over and over. All right, so now I want to get to the heart of where I think things are going to go, which is external threats, that is, false fact checkers. If fact checking is the big thing, what we expect is going to be a tax against fact checkers, and the easiest way to do that is to create fake fact checkers. So, so for the first, I'll take you through, let me take you through the assassination of Jamal Khashoggi. Uh, Jamal Khashoggi was lured into a consulate uh, he was uh, murdered and butchered. Uh, perhaps uh, the, uh, the Saudi government would have gotten away with this, but for the fact that he had brought his fiance to the consulate, not inside the consulate, but dropped him off outside. Um, and Hadijay never saw him leave. So she alerted the, the, the Turkish authorities. I never saw him leave. He went in and didn't come out. So if you're the Saudi government and you're planning the assassination of an American resident dissident, um, you need to make sure that no one believes her. So what do you come up with? What you do is you launch a fact-checking group that you, had, that you had registered basically two weeks earlier to claim that she doesn't exist. She's not really his fiance. She's either an Israeli or Turkish agent Okay, that's making this story up. And what you do is you get the fake fact checker to say, we looked at photos of them together and she's photoshopped into all of them. The problem is they didn't know that the Turks had bugged the embassy and so they had recordings of the murder. So they immediately had to change their strategy and say, okay, okay, uh, she's not an imposter. She's not an imposter. Everything that we wrote before was probably right, but unfortunately he died during a fight that broke out. This is the actual language on this slide. A fight broke out. Um, so instead they switched to he's a jihadist. Okay? And uh, President Trump, in repeating this slur, though disclaiming it, uh, did specifically note that it was Saudi representatives uh, that had brought it up. Okay? So what do we know about these fact checkers? They're easy to create, but you need to have them for a little while to establish goodwill. Okay? And really they exist just to lend credibility to other propagandists. So look for dormant or credible sites to go active during uh, salient times. Uh, number two, you can, you can just have an imposter checking group. So here you have an existing fact checking group and you create an imposter site that looks just like it. Here you have a real fact checker saying the HPV vaccine is not linked to cancer. On the other side, you can see the imitation group saying, in fact, it is linked to cancer. Um, 
the main thing that this group pushed out was the fact that this cripple poisoning was unrelated to Russia. So we can be pretty sure that this was masterminded by Russian agents. And again, we have to be careful about this entering the discourse. There have been reports that President Trump has pushed this same narrative when uh, discussing this cripple poisoning uh, with uh, then Prime Minister Theresa May. So here we have the idea of trading on the credibility and goodwill to push a message, and you get the added benefit, uh, be benefit of damaging credibility of the impersonated group. But the main thing here, and the reason why I would focus on this, is that this requires the misuse of intellectual property. And the thing that I would like to push during this talk is to say, Yes, I understand that free speech is very important, but something that will get social firms to take things down is when you bring up the DMCA and you note that this is a violation of intellectual property and those things go down very quickly. Okay? So this may be easy for you to detect, alert the firm, let the firm know to contact social media and take this down. And the third, and this is going to be a longer discussion, so I'll abbreviate it, is you can impersonate fact-checked content. So rather than impersonating a, uh, a fact-checking group, you can just say, oh, this is a New York Times piece, or oh, this is a Bloomberg piece. The main group that's been doing this so far is Iranian. Uh, I, will, I do not say this out of pride. It's really a beautiful piece of work. Um, and if, if I have time during the questions, I'll tell you what's just very nice about it. But this is not pride of authorship. Okay. Uh, We'll, we'll jump to that. So what are some possible solutions? Well, the first is that we'd like to obviously to push ethical handling. Okay, the idea that social firms have a duty to prevent this, not necessarily sounding in law, uh, is something worth pushing. The idea that ICANN and other URL controlling groups can prevent cyber squatting, which is a necessary step to imperson uh, imp impersonation, is also important. However, I would ask you to limit exposure. Okay. You as individual actors can limit exposure. When you see something that's so sensational it's, it can't possibly be true, it's probably not. Please don't share it. When you post your, your pictures online, please watermark them because the removal of that watermark will create another action under the DMCA for you to have them immediately pulled down. We need to teach critical thinking and we need to employ reverse image searching to make sure we don't repeat the mistakes of attacks that uh, occurred against our democracy in 2016. I would leave you with this set of propaganda and uh, fighting posters from World War II. We are under attack. Please, you know, consider all the ways in which we need to defend ourselves. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Um, next, we'll have Jason. He'll be showing slides from his seat. Okay, perfect. Okay. Time's up already. <laughs> no, no, no. You're, you're okay. good. We've, we've got dual timing happening. You're I, I good clock. to go. All yes. right. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, first of all, to Emily and the <coughs> students uh, for putting this all together and for inviting me to be a part of it, and to Erica and Ronell as well. Um, a few caveats. I like to lower expectations before I talk uh, as much as possible. So um, I did go to law school. Uh, I uh, am not, however, a lawyer. Um, uh, thankfully, in the various jobs that I've had, including at the State Department, uh, much smarter people were lawyers for me, and, um, and I very much appreciated that. Um, I also am not an academic. I do teach at Georgetown, uh, as Erica mentioned, but I'm, I'm not an academic and don't do academic research. Um, so unlike many of the other distinguished panelists uh, who've come before me and sit next to me, um, my thoughts will probably be pretty shallow. Um, and although I will be speaking about the Global Network Initiative principles, uh, I'm speaking in a personal capacity, and so please don't interpret my words as authoritative in terms of what the principles necessarily mean. So with all that out of the way, what is GNI? Um, Where does he point? When it was working. Do I point it that way? What are we pointing it at? I don't know. The, there over go. there, <laughs> apparently. Okay, so what is GNI? GNI is a uh, multi-stakeholder initiative which brings together companies in the information communication technology sector, so these are internet companies, but also telecommunications companies, equipment vendors, uh, as well as, so those uh, form one constituency within GNI. We have civil society organizations, primarily media freedom organizations like the Committee to Protect Journalists and human rights groups like Human Rights Watch. We have investors and we have academics, including academics like Evelyn and independent experts like Rebecca. Um, all of these actors come together through GNI um, to push for and advance freedom of expression and privacy rights in the ICT sector. Um, we have a set of principles, the GNI principles, that guide companies on just how they should do that. Um, so the next 
slide uh, just gives you a kind of pictorial sense of how broad our membership is. Um, and then I want to just briefly show this uh, graphic to kind of discuss some of our key functions. So GNI companies uh, commit to implementing the principles that I mentioned, as well as some more detailed implementation guidelines. Um, and we have an accountability mechanism um, that we use our multi-stakeholder initiative to, uh, to uh, help ensure that they are actually taking uh, good faith efforts to implement those principles and making improvements over time. That allows us to generate a certain amount of trust and credibility across our membership, uh, which allows us to do things like facilitate good practice and shared learning and collaboration and in addressing some of these thorny issues that you've heard about today, uh, as well as to empower policy advocacy, both facilitating our members' own advocacy, am amplifying their advocacy, as well as speaking as GNI ourselves. We have a relatively unique voice. Um, and we hope that all of this really helps to serve the broader uh, purposes of protecting user rights in the ICT space. Um, so where does GNI fit? Um, so this is kind of an overly simplistic graphic that is probably inaccurate in many ways, but um, GNI really attempts to uh, distill concepts of international law, and Evelyn did a great job of kind of explaining what those are uh, in the free expression context, um, and helping to translate what they mean for corporate practice so that companies can essentially use them as a shield or at least as a way to mitigate the potential impacts of domestic law and domestic law compliance that would uh, impact user rights. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's sort of a, a tricky function, um, uh, but one that I think really is in some ways quite unique and, and important. Um, I'll walk you through some of the kind of core principles um, and, and try and sort of use those to understand what it would mean for a company to think about uh, its efforts to address disinformation, both in terms of its own, domestic, its own corporate policies as well as how it complies with uh, laws that are attempting to address disinformation. Um, so on freedom of expression, um, these, the, the red text from here on out is language from our principles, and then there'll be blue text that's not on this slide, but you'll see later on that is uh, from the implementation guidelines. So I just want to point out that um, with regard to both freedom of expression and then here on privacy, um, one of the critical points about um, GNI's scope and mandate is that we really are focused on the intersection of corporate practice and government demands or government restrictions. Um, and so when a company is, um, for example, um, deciding that it doesn't want a conversation around um, skee-ball on its platform because it just doesn't like skee-ball uh, and it doesn't want that to be something that people on their platform talk about, independent of any government pressure to restrict discussion of skee-ball, that's not really a GNI matter, right? And so it's sometimes uh, difficult but important for us as GNI to make that as clear as we can. Um, so uh, you see that in our, um, in, in our, in the, the principles that I just showed you, the reference to government restrictions, demands, laws, or regulations. Um, and I wanted to just, as I was preparing for this, you know, I think that's a hard thing to understand increasingly in the ICT ecosystem. What is a government demand? Um, what is a, a government restriction? Um, but I think it's especially hard in the context of disinformation. Um, you know, Tim Wu has talked about, and, and others as well, how disinformation is really a different kind of problem than some of the other ones we face because it's not about taking content down necessarily so much as it can be about flooding uh, an information environment uh, or manipulating an information uh, environment. He uses the term sensorial weapon, which I kind of like. Um, uh, so these are you know, the kinds of questions we have to grapple with. You know, is a uh, government public service announcement propaganda or, uh, or isn't it? Um, is a political party's campaign to propagate a certain meme a government action, a government restriction, or isn't it? Um, is a private marketing firm that has been hired by somebody who is affiliated with a political party um, but maybe has sort of quasi-independent relationship, uh, is that a government action or not? Um, so I put a footnote in here. Uh, to uh, Molly Land's uh, forthcoming report, which I think, uh, law review article, which, which does a really good job of grappling with some of these questions. Um, 
Molly is another one of our academic members. But these are the kinds of things that at GNI we really um, we, we really try and pay a lot of attention to. So keep that in mind as we walk through some of these uh, points. Um, so I, this is not a, a scientific uh, review of all the GNI principles or implementation guidelines that would be relevant if you were a company trying to address disinformation in a rights-respecting way. But these are some of the ones that I think are really salient. Um, so one is really making sure that you address human rights issues uh, really at the top, um, that you have um, uh, board members and senior officers who are responsible for key decisions are really informed about your company's human rights commitments. Um, so that means having, first of all, a human rights commitment um, and ensuring that the right people at high levels are educated um, uh, and making sure that that flows down through all of the rights kinds of processes within a company. Um, uh, so these are just, I'm not going to read through these, but I, I put them up there. The black text is just my sort of illustrative uh, thinking of the kinds of things that you would want to do if you were a company implementing the GNI principles and uh, in the context of disinformation. Um, another thing that's really important, and Evelyn talked about this, I, I should just as an aside note that the UN guiding principles and the GNI principles were developed around the same time. Uh, and there was actually quite a bit of crosstalk that was happening. There were uh, people involved on John, Professor John Ruggie's team, who was the, uh, the Secretary General's um, Special Representative for Business and Human Rights at the time, uh, who participated in the GNI conversation. So the two are, and we have since uh, updated the GNI principles to make sure they're consistent with the broader UN uh, guiding principles. Um, so um, this idea of operational control is very similar to the concept in the UN guiding principles. Sorry, this is the wrong slide. Um, here. Um, uh, the, in the UN Guiding Principles, the concepts of um, cause and contribute uh, and directly linked, um, these are kind of the key um, uh, ways for a company to um, understand when its conduct may end up uh, either facilitating or, uh, or in other ways, um, uh, allowing a government to impose restrictions on, on the rights of their users. Um, this point 5.1 from the, from the GNI principles about uh, collaboration is really important um, and something that, that GNI itself seeks to facilitate, but we also in, really um, uh, preach to, to all of our members that they seek out even broader ways uh, to, to collaborate. Uh, and I want to just note the, the approach that um, Facebook articulated this morning in terms of their efforts around disinformation, uh, as well as the oversight board, I think really are a good exemplification, in my personal opinion, of that kind of um, really proactive uh, collaboration and, and seeking input from outside voices. Um, so uh, another key principle um, is around government engagement. Um, so that means everything from interpreting an order or demand or a restriction that it, uh, a company gets in the narrowest way possible so as to mitigate the human rights impacts of that uh, compliance. And that's very much consistent with what Evelyn was articulating about uh, the UN guiding principles and, and how they uh, recommend companies to, to address those kinds of domestic laws. Um, but also about proactively engaging governments um, to uh, design and develop laws and regulations that are, are less rights infringing or less likely to put the company in a situation where uh, it may need to, uh, it, it may end up infringing on the rights of their citizens. Um, and, um, and then finally, um, being held accountable. So I mentioned how um, GNI provides a framework for allowing um, the non-company constituents of our board to be able to sort of peek under the hood, as it were, um, and look at uh, a company's own uh, actions to implement this very detailed set of principles and implementation guidelines. Um, that is all done in a very confidential manner through um, a, a system that we've designed that uh, provides enough assurance to the companies that uh, the information that they are sharing, uh, much of which is sensitive for business reasons or other reasons, um, is not going to leak out. And on the other hand, giving 
the non-company stakeholders in GNI enough information to feel reasonably confident that they can make the kind of determination uh, that we ask them to, which is that the company is, is implementing these principles uh, in good faith with improvement over time. Um, and so far, we're now in our third cycle of assessment of GNI companies. Um, it, we're very happy that that process, you know, with tweaks and improvements along the way, seems to be working. Um, I don't. I don't want to suggest that any of these things um, necessarily mean that GNI is. Um, the place where all the problems uh, that have been articulated on the previous panels uh, and others that no doubt will be articulated in the Q&A for our session um, can be solved. Um, we are, however, actively working on this issue of disinformation and thinking about how we can foster greater collaboration, um, both in terms of accountability as well as in terms of um, engagement with governments um, uh, and helping to come up with good ideas for our member companies. Um, and we are um, always very eager to share with other initiatives um, that are trying to foster greater collaboration, information sharing uh, about the lessons we've learned about striking that balance, for instance, between the need for confidentiality and the need for um, you know, legitimate assurance. Um, so we're very happy to be here to talk about all of that. Um, look forward to the Q&A. I did want to just close with one more slide to note that GNI is not uh, operating in a vacuum. Um, this is just a, a very preliminary list of all of the relevant sort of frameworks that I could think of that um, I think have something to say on this topic, um, starting with the kind of more business and human rights um, frameworks like the UNGPs and the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises um, to more technology and, and internet specific frameworks like the UNESCO Rome principles. Um, you can see I forgot to fill in the dot, dot, dots here. There were some reports that I uh, should have uh, uh, cited here. Um, we've already heard about the, the reports um, from David Kay, the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression, um, that, that have touched on some of the relevant issues here. The Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, which is recently rebranded branded as UN Human Rights, is um, initiating a new project on um, business and human rights in the ICT sector, which will be very interesting. Uh, Reporters Without Borders has a new initiative uh, on information and democracy. The EU has its own code of practice for disinformation. And then um, lastly, just want to commend um, a series of papers that have recently been produced by the Transatlantic High-Level Working Group on content moderation online and freedom of expression, uh, in particular the one that Camille Francois from Graphica uh, put out on actors' behaviors and content. So that's, uh, that's it for me, and I um, look forward to the Q&A. Okay, um, thank you. Our final speaker will be Rebecca, who also has slides. Um, so, Rebecca. Hi, if you're still awake. Hello, wake up. <laughs> um, no, I, I didn't mean that, <laughs> that way. But last, last speaker, of, and, and what's even worse is that not, am I, not only am I not a lawyer, but I don't even have a law degree. So I'm really not qualified to be here. Um, so if you feel like continuing to sleep, that's just fine. I'll, I'll forgive you. I did once, uh, by mistake, was allowed to teach a law school class uh, jointly with Cynthia Wong, who used to be at Human Rights Watch, and now at Twitter, some of you know. We made the mistake of giving people grades we thought they actually deserved, and that was the uh, last time we ever taught that class. <laughs> uh, but uh, in any case, um, so that's that's as, as, as close as I am to... Uh, sort of law degrees, as it were. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is um, a perspective on corporate responsibility for disinformation in the context of the work that my colleagues and I do at Ranking Digital Rights. Um, and this is not a, a, a presentation about Ranking Digital Rights' entire project and results, but I, I'm, I'm going to give you uh, just a brief context so that uh, uh, everything else I say uh, makes any sense at all. Ranking digital rights, um, many of you are probably familiar with Freedom House and the Freedom, Freedom in the World, Freedom on the Net, Freedom of the Press indexes that rank countries. We rank companies, right? And so uh, right now we, we rank two dozen of the world's most powerful internet, mobile, and telecommunications companies on their policies and practices that affect users' freedom of expression and privacy. Um, we build our indicators. We have 
uh, 35 indicators that, that uh, companies have uh, been evaluated on in the last couple of indexes. Um, those are going to expand to deal even more with what we believe are the upstream uh, causes of, uh, of disinformation that I'll, I'll talk about a bit later. But we build very heavily on the UN Guiding Principles for Business and Human Rights. Uh, in, in terms of expecting companies to have strong commitments, to have strong governance, to be doing human rights impact assessments, to be transparent with those affected uh, um, or potentially harmed about uh, what their policies and practices are and what the risks are, what they're doing to mitigate the risks, uh, and to have grievance, uh, effective uh, grievance and remedy practices. You know, those are all very key aspects of the UN Guiding Principles. We also draw heavily um, uh, on the, the Global Network Initiative um, principles in our indicators that deal with government uh, surveillance and censorship demands. Um, but uh, we're much broader than GNI, which only deals with government demands officially. Um, we also look at the human rights, or we're looking for, for companies to be accountable uh, and, and uh, uh, in, in their practices and, and disclose policies around content moderation, how they handle private demands, not just government demands, either to take down content or to share content, how they're, how they're, uh, what they're doing commercially uh, in terms of co collecting data um, uh, and, and data handling and sharing practices with all types of entities, not just governments, and, and their security practices as well. So we're broader. The other way in which we're different from the GNI, GNI does assess companies, but it's opt-in, um, and, and it's only assessing companies on what their, their board has agreed they'll be assessed on, and the, gov the companies are members of the board. So, so we, we, we decide who we're going to assess. You can't opt out if you're going to be, if you're going to be ranked by us. Um, so there are a number of, of companies that are ranked against their will. That's too bad. Um, and and so so in the and and uh, we do engage with companies on what they're going to be ranked on, uh, but we don't let give them veto power over what they're going to be ranked on. We, we consult with a broad set of experts from the human rights community, technical communities, and so on. So that's, that's basically what we do. And you can go to our website, rankingdigitalrights.org, if you want a full breakdown on how Facebook did on every single little question <laughs> and sub-question, uh, which would be a two-hour presentation alone. Um, but you're welcome to do that. Um, so what I want to talk, uh, spend the rest of my time talking about is how our work has brought us to think about the disinformation problem or misinformation, problems of bad speech online generally, and what to do about it. Most regulatory conversations, let's so, see, oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm hitting the wrong button and the wrong thing. So most, most uh, regulatory conversations are taking place in this pink area. It's, it's all about the, the content, the speech, the information that is published and circulated online, what's bad, what's not, why it's bad, why it's not, how to identify it, how to track it, who's responsible for keeping it off the internet or stopping it from circulating, who's legally liable for doing so, and et cetera, right? So most of the regulatory, and really most of the con conversations, the discourse generally is about that. Um, and, and also about grievance and remedy uh, to, to a certain degree, and Facebook's oversight board is primarily about that, um, looking at cases of people whose content got taken down or accounts deactivated and whether that was the right decision or not and, and sort of a, a appealing on that. And of course, grievance and remedy is a key part of the UN guiding principles, so, so that's not to, uh, not to diminish that in any case, um, the, the fact that Facebook's looking to strengthen grievance and remedy and oversight around what's taken down, what's not, is great, but that's not the whole picture. There's all these upstream issues, and several speakers throughout the day have talked about the importance of looking at the underlying factors that contribute to the dissemination and prioritization uh, the viral virality of certain content uh, or the ability of those who are seeking to weaponize information to, to reach certain audiences. And that's what I, I increasingly like to call the upstream issues. So, um, so our indicators 
And again, this is not a seminar about all our indicators. You can go onto our, our website and, and look at them. Um, but really deal very heavily with the governance around the risks. So at, at the board level, do you have commitment to address and mitigate all human rights risks, all risks to users, not just related to government demands, but all of them? Impact assessment, are you doing impact assessment to, to understand not just how your handling of government demands is, is dealing with, uh, is, is affecting users' rights, but how your business model is affecting users' rights, how your use of, of, how your design of your platform, how your algorithms and so on are affecting users' rights. Engaging with stakeholders to, to understand how people are being affected and, and in the formulation of the rules. And then being, trans, then being clear um, uh, about what your policy is and, your pol and in, engaging in your policy formulation processes and also transparency reporting uh, about, in, in the case of speech, all the different factors that cause some, that cause speech to either be shaped or taken down or restricted or a speaker to be silenced or limited in any way. What are all the different ways in which speech, speech can be shaped or restricted and is the platform being sufficiently transparent about all the different ways under whose auspices, under what authority? Um, and and uh, while Jamil talked about transparency reporting, um, you know, being something that that companies are, are making improvements on, there's a long way to go in terms of people really being able to understand all the things, all the factors that led to you seeing certain things and not other things uh, in your feed or being able to reach certain audiences and not. Uh, and who has more power to reach un different audiences under what circumstances than not. Um, so a few things from our uh, uh, our 2019 index that kind of speak to these upstream factors. I'm just cher cherry picking a, a couple of, of points of data. So uh, in our governance indicators, oops, I keep, I keep hitting my computer and not, not the thing. Um, in our governance indicators, uh, we look at how comprehensive companies' human rights impact assessments are. And I've just flagged the three companies that kind of, whose names are most closely associated with, with disinformation and misinformation problems. Um, so there's a variety. This is the overall score. This, this indicator actually has um, basically a dozen different elements um, that, that lead to this. We're looking at impact assessment on government demands. We're looking at impact assessment uh, on a range of other things as well. And so to, to kind of break that indicator down a little bit, um, Three of the elements of this indicator look at does the company conduct impact assessment on their terms of service and enforcement. Only three companies in the entire index do any impact assessment on their terms of service and enforcement. Note who is not here. None of those three companies that were flagged on the previous slide, um, including the one represented today. Um, who's doing any impact assessment around their algorithms, auto automated decision-making, and AI. These are the, co the, the companies that show any evidence of doing such. Um, note whose absence. Is anybody doing impact assessment on how their targeted advertising business models affect uh, users' rights or, or the rights, you know, also, we're, we're, you know, when we're, and we're talking about human rights, we're talking about affecting communities as well as individuals. Um, there is nobody. So to, to go through this quickly, oops, hang on. Yeah, we are seeing some improvement in, in some areas. So in 2015, nobody was issuing any transparency reporting data about the volume and nature of content that they were removed in enforcing their terms of service. That has improved. We now have four companies that are releasing increasingly detailed information about what's being removed when they enforce their terms of service. So, so that's good. Uh, however, um, transparency about handling of external requests to restrict ex expression, so that's transparency about government demands and the both the circumstances under which you respond to government demands 
as well as private demand. So whether it's DMCA takedowns or, you know, depending on what jurisdiction you're in, there might be defamation cases or whatever. Um, so there's, there's varying quality of disclosure. Uh, and, uh, and so you can kind of see the, the three companies I, I flagged there and, and so on. There's a lot of room for improvement in this disclosure, um, which I, I think the opacity about what's happening to people's content and who's trying to get it taken down, um, if we don't understand that, it's much harder to have a clear conversation about the, the human rights implications and who's responsible and where the abuses are potentially happening. Um, so then to move on, um, another root cause um, of, of disinformation, as some people have already pointed out in some of the previous presentations, has to do with targeted advertising, the fact that digital marketers can obtain uh, information uh, about users in very segmented, uh, categorized way and, and target them with specific messages, including, including disinformation or, or other, other messages they want to target those people uh, with to get them to do something, whether it's to buy something or to act in a certain way or to hate somebody or whatever, uh, or vote in a certain way. And uh, in terms of disclosing the, just dis disclosing options that people have to actually control the way in which their information is used and shared, we have a long way to go um, uh, in, in terms of that kind of disclosure. And I would, I would just point, this is another root cause uh, that I think regulators and, and sort of the discourse in general around what companies need to be doing is focused too much on, you know, you're not censoring well enough and less on, you know, the, the, the fact that the, 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 the ability to target with messages and the design of the platforms to, to target people with messages is very sophisticated. Um, and so just quickly then, um, I'm just going to point you to some new indicators that we've just published that we're going to be using in our next, or that we're gonna pilot for use in our next index that get in an even more granular way at what we believe are upstream causes of disinformation, misinformation, but also other forms of content people don't like that's not necessarily illegal. Um, so algorithms, machine learning, and artificial intelligence, as well as targeted advertising, um, with, with a lot of emphasis on due diligence and transparency. And I don't have time, I'm not going to read through this whole thing. And, and you can go online and look at the new indicators. But I would just um, quickly say that in our new indicators, looking at algorithms, automation, and ma machine learning, um, we're looking for the ability for not only disclosure, but a lot more uh, option to opt out or opt in on what what types of things is being curated in your account. Um, minimize the differential impact of content, uh, automated content moderation on, on users. Um, there needs to be more proactive measures to prevent, detect, and remedy large-scale manipulation and bias and discrimination that can happen uh, because of the design of platforms, et cetera. Um, I, again, don't want to take up too much more time. And targeted advertising, really in a nutshell, to encapsulate all of this text on the page that I'm not going to read out verbatim, a lot of it has to do with the need for oversight, impact assessment, stakeholder engagement, and remedy around what's happening. Um, but also, there needs to be a great deal more transparency uh, about how people are being targeted. But there also needs to be limitations, and this has been brought up before by other speakers, on what types of data um, that advertisers and marketers should be allowed to use to target segments. But this, this needs to be much more transparent and clear what the rules are. The rules <laughs> need to be much tighter. And as companies design better rules around this, um, those, those, there needs to be impact assessment and, and clear mechanisms to identify harm and alleviate harm and to demonstrate that you are actively working to prevent harm. And that is absolutely critical 
aspect of under the UN guiding principles, frankly, uh, to be doing that. So our indicators get in a very specific way about what types of disclosures and policies and practices companies ought to have uh, in order to, to mitigate harm and be more transparent with users about what's happening. So, so that's that. I'm over time. Um, there's some links you can go and, and look for more information. Uh, and I'm happy to answer questions. Great. All right. And as is our custom, we will turn to those experts in the conference to pose the first questions. I just wanted to make a couple summary remarks to link the content of this panel. Um, so as you'll notice, we've talked about international law, a treaty that is opt-in, not every country is opted in, and we've talked about soft law standards. Some would argue it's not even soft law. We are in the space of norms that are emerging and developing, um, some involving democratic processes and governments through the UN, um, but many involving private actors through multi-stakeholder initiative in these conversations. So we are in the space of self-regulation. This is a corporate social responsibility panel because it's not a regulation panel. Um, it's regulated to the extent that those are under development by the private institutions that are at issue themselves. So there are questions around that. Um, we've heard about a private governance structure through the GNI that is trying to, that has put forth standards. And Rebecca's work enters at an interesting place because it's trying to assess the extent to which there's implementation of the standards that do exist, um, few of which yet maturing into hard law, um, putting aside EU type regulations. So um, with that, I will turn to other participants, yes, if there's. Um, great, thank you. So I feel like one response that um, I often hear in these conversations when we're sort of hoping and expecting the platforms to do the right thing um, and do it voluntarily as a matter of sort of self-regulation is, well, no, I mean, we can't trust them to do that. And also sometimes they legally can't do that because they have fiduciary obligations to their shareholders. They have to maximize their profits. And like, this is one of the critiques that we hear about, you know, uh, platforms taking on information fiduciary type responsibilities to protect privacy or, you know, any number of these, these moves that are deemed as self-regulatory. And so, I guess I'm just wondering if are there lessons that we can learn from the corporate social responsibility history that we have in other areas for how we might respond to those kinds of reactions um, when, they, when they come up? Or are they valid concerns that, that, that do need to be taken into account? Okay. Um, Rebecca? Thanks. Uh, that's a great, great set of questions. Um, First of all, I mean, I, I guess with, with the work that Ranking Digital Rights does, and I think the work that many people uh, on the panel does, I, I don't think the message is this should all be voluntary and there should be no law. That uh, if, if we had good privacy law in this country, uh, scores would go up in a number of indicators, and that would be a very good thing. And, it, and it's become, we, we've done an analysis of that increasingly, you know, there are certain indicators on which companies seem to be willing to act voluntarily and then other indicators on which it's going to take law. Um, and uh, so, and, and also there are some companies that do a lot worse in the index because they're in jurisdictions that prevent them from respecting users' rights much more than others. Uh, and so there's that interplay there. Um, so, th so that's one thing that, that uh, I, I think, and particularly when the, within the UN Guiding Principles Framework, first pillar is government duty to protect human rights and then corporate responsibility to respect. But the, the corporations, the, the company's ability to respect is handicapped if the government's not doing its job and none of them are doing their jobs. It's just to varying degrees of how badly, right? So, so that's, that's kind of one thing. It's all, it's all intertwined and it's about, okay, Given that we can't wait for governments to get more perfect before we push companies to do better, we want companies to do everything they can to, to mitigate, anticipate, and design around <laughs> and operate around companies, uh, governments not doing their job. Uh, so that's, that's one thing. Um, in terms of, of uh, 
uh, you know, company's fiduciary responsibility. You know, the, famously in August, the Business Roundtable came out with a statement admitting that uh, a company's responsibility isn't just to shareholders, it's to stakeholders. And actually, there's there's been a community of investors and, and actually companies who for the last couple of decades have been operating in that way, right? Um, and uh, recognizing that uh, not only... Do companies have a responsibility to contribute positively to society um, uh, and, and not sort of run the planet so ragged that, you know, they can't succeed anyway, right? And to contribute to a, to a sustainable world in which our children and grandchildren can even live, uh, let alone be free, um, and, and, and so on. And that's, that's kind of part of, of the expectation of the company. But in, increasingly, companies realize that um, there are long-term material risks with acting irresponsibly. I, I think in the climate change era, area, that's very clear at this point, and you have a lot of companies that are, are really trying to build their brand uh, around being responsible, and a number of companies even sort of, even though the U.S. withdrew from the Paris Agreement. The number of companies are staying in it, in part out of self-interest, um, and and so similarly, I think in the digital rights realm, a company that's screwing their users by abusing their data, in the long run, that's abusing people's trust, and that's not good for your business. And there's an increasing number of shareholders that recognize that, and you're seeing a growing number of shareholder resolutions. Uh, being brought forth to companies, insisting on better governance, insisting on better risk assessment, and insisting on more responsible practices. So, so it's, you know, there's, there's uh, no reason companies, you know, it, for, for a company to say, I can't do anything about my advertising business model because I would be you know, violating my agreement with shareholders. It's bullshit. No, okay, not to put um, just a two pointer on this. There's some shareholders. There were a couple of derivative shareholder actions filed in the aftermath of the Cambridge Analytical debacle for um, Facebook. So, um, but I understand you had a question, Andy. Sorry about my language. Thanks. Uh, first of all, thank you all, and 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 thanks for for including us in this conference. This whole day has been um, terrific. So uh, we've been very much in listening mode, not uh, sort of back and forth, but it's been we've been taking it all in. Very fair points and valid criticism all the way around. So appreciate the um, the the discussion. The uh, question and a bit of a uh, maybe this is for for everybody. It was b building off something you'd said, Rebecca, on the um, the chart that you had around uh, the over on the oversight board in particular. Um, yes, users are meant to. Um, offer an appeal, uh, ask for an appeal. The, the other mechanism is that Facebook can send to the board a, a decision that it, or, uh, sorry, Facebook can send cases to the board uh, where it says, we need, we want you outside, outside experts, not uh, paid by Facebook to make these decisions uh, that actually then do go up to the top of your chart to inform policy. And all of these are, yes, there's a case that you were deciding, should that piece of content be up or should it not? But it's all meant to do that. And so my question is actually around the transparency of that, because uh, that, that's meant to, all of that is meant to be public, right? The board's decision is meant to be public. Facebook then responds publicly. And I guess my question is, how, how for everybody, is how, what, what way, in what ways could we be more transparent about how that's working? Does that question make sense? So do you mean more transparent than what is already? No, in the as the as the oversight board, we're you know we're building this oversight board. As the oversight board uh, releases a decision uh, publicly, not by Facebook communications team, just the oversight board does, and then Facebook responds to that and and implements something based off of that. Um, what are the ways we should be thinking? And this is for another time too. But what are the ways we should be thinking about? how we can be as transparent as possible about that. Because what I was hearing, what I'm hearing is 
Facebook is, may not be as transparent in some of the indicators, and I, I could understand that. But we had this opportunity to build this thing. We'd love to know how to do it in an even more transparent way. Okay, and, and this is a great question because one of the few tools that human rights advocates have is information and transparency. This is why this is such a dear principle for us. Um, and the more it is we know, and the UN guiding principles contemplate that every business should be able to know what their impacts are and be able to show and communicate that to the public. So it could very well may be that businesses are being ranked, um, they're lower or higher based on how much it is they share. So if I can just maybe reformulate or simplify the question, um, in what ways can industry do better in sharing relevant salient information that speaks to human rights impacts that could be actionable, informing policy and informing those of us who are trying to defend human rights? Fair? No? <laughs> I mean, the, the question on sort of how to score better on RDR is really for Rebecca, uh, but I, th I, I think Facebook has been pretty good, actually, on, and not just because they're a GNI member, but I imagine that is part of the reason that I quickly flashed through the, the, the GNI principle on accountability, and I focused on the independent assessment mechanism, but the other part of that is public transparency. Um, and even before this um, appeals mechanism was designed, Facebook began to be transparent about the minutes of the um, conversation, the internal Facebook conversations about the content um, guidelines and if and when those were to be changed in the wake of various issues, including um, feedback that that content moderators were were providing up the chain, as it were, within Facebook, and I thought, you know, that was a very that was not something Facebook had to do, but it was something that I think gave insight to the users, and particularly those who are, you know, really interested in grappling with what it means to be governing speech at that kind of scale, um, and that I think will continue, as I understand it, under this new um, mechanism, because that essentially the the appeals mechanism will feed into that conversation. Um, I think, you know, making sure that that's ideally all available in one place so that the, the board's determinations, which are not Facebook content, but is, is related to, of course, then Facebook's own responses, um, which you indicated, which you, you mentioned are going to be um, also made public, um, not having to sort of switch between various websites to be able to see the full picture. I mean, that kind of thing is very mechanistic and simple, but, but can, can make it a lot easier for someone from the outside who's trying to understand how this all works. Okay. Um, Rebecca, a brief response to that, because we will have time for engagement, and I'd like to turn to some of the um, online questions. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a really interesting question, and, and uh, it, it, in a way, it goes beyond also just direct transparency to reporting, right? And, and as a former journalist, I'm immediately thinking about Dahlia and, and court reporting and what kind of reporting and journalism and investigation is going to be possible around this whole process. And I hope it's very robust and not blocked, uh, to speak also to uh, Jamil's uh, point earlier. And, and having uh, being very supportive of whistleblowers in your company would be a good thing. Right. Okay, so I'm going to turn to some of the questions that have come in from you, the audience. Um, there were a number of questions, actually, Andrew, about your presentation and some of your proposals. Um, the audience would like to hear more about the um, end of your presentation where you talked about um, maybe the user beware or the, the, the final World War II posters that you shared. Sure. Uh, and then the second one is the intellectual property concerns with the photos and memes. Um, and the producers of content and social media sites, can they be punished for these violations? Are there violations for reposting memes? I guess it's in a nutshell asking us how we would deploy copyright protection law to be more protective of, of society. Okay, I'm gonna take the second part first. Um, so, uh, reposting something that is copyright infringement in and of itself is not going to have uh, liability. Uh, basically, the reason why firms are responsive to this is because there is uh, essentially immunity for third-party posted content under the Communication Decency Act, Section 230. However, there is a, um, uh, a carve-out for intellectual property misuse. So uh, one of the ways that you can deploy copyright to stop uh, hate speech 
is that uh, propagandists tend to reuse the same photos over and over, and those photos are owned by their Getty images or uh, whichever photographer took those. You alert Getty. You say, like, hey, did someone pay the licensing fee to use this? And Getty will say no. And they'll say, oh, there's a misuse of this photo. Take it down. The example that should spring to mind, and I'm not saying this is necessarily hate speech, uh, but uh, the tweets that President Trump has uh, pulled down have largely involved using music and music videos that don't belong to him. And uh, Twitter, which hasn't done a great job of pulling down other things, uh, pulled those down to sweet. So uh, that's, that's number two. Uh, so number one, which is now number two, uh, which are what are different ways that people can help cut this down. Uh, so you're part of the content churn, which is really unfortunate. So um, <laughs> you're, uh, you're both the audience, you're both the cow and the lion um, for, uh, for this project. And so how can we make you a little bit less the cow? Uh, is if you watermark your photos, removing that watermark itself creates another cause. Uh, it's an additional penalty uh, under the DMCA because your watermark is itself a form of digital rights management, um, number one. Uh, number two, set your settings to private whenever possible. Uh, and number three, when you happen upon something that seems sensational but untrue, uh, take a moment and remember that we're in the middle of a you know, multi-continental cyber war. And that much like the advice during World War II, which was you know, be careful about spreading misinformation, be aware that the enemy may be trying to feed you misinformation, it is, it is a dereliction of duty that the government is not warning you about this Currently, there's a statement of like, oh, who interfered as if that interference is over. It is not. It is ongoing and will ramp up with the months to come. So if you see something that seems too good to be true, it most likely is. And just take a moment. Uh, just, just take a moment is all I ask. Right. Okay. Um, another set of series of questions that I want to combine. Um, well, oh, here's one that's just different. Um, how would Andrew Yang's idea of requiring companies to pay users for, their for a click of their information play into this conversation? I guess this is a variant of the, if we had a different business model, if we imagined users as content providers were being paid for what it is we provide, our eyeballs, might this look different? Um, unrelated, but also interesting for our audience is they aren't sure what the right measure or metric would be and want to know what percentage of U.S. companies are actively working to implement the UNGPs or the G&I principles. So um, I'll, I'll just reframe that as how widespread or how much reach do these normative principles that we've talked about have in the business community? And then two, might we imagine inverting a business model such that there'd be a, perhaps a disincentive if we were being paid for what we provide? I'll <coughs> speak very quickly to the first point, just to say that, um, so there are um, 12 companies currently in GNI, but we are very clear that we encourage the GNI principles and implementation guidelines to be adopted by companies, even if they don't decide to join GNI and, and subject themselves to the accountability mechanism that GNI provides. Um, so I, I don't want people to think that the GNI principles only are being implemented or, or in some way, shape, or form informing the policies of those of the, those that are our members. Um, uh, and I think Rebecca's work, RDR's work, helps to show how um, companies who are not members of GNI compare to those that are members of GNI and, and maybe where um, some of the GNI principles and the companies implementing them have led other companies um, to improve their practices. Um, I, I think on the second point, you know, I guess my only cautionary note there would be that just because we come up with a different business model does not mean that platforms will, you know, they won't continue to be ways that platforms can be manipulated. Um, that will continue. It'll, it'll be different. It'll look different. Um, um, but there are things that I think, you know, um, 
do affect you know the speed and the the scope uh, and the scale of of messaging that I think are uh, at least causally related to some of the challenges around disinformation. So to to speak to this, I don't know if they're asking about what percentage is tech sector or kind of platforms or kind of industry generally. Um, it's uh, with ranking digital rights, um, the comp when you get beyond the GNI companies, we're not seeing a whole lot of evidence, even with say Apple and Twitter who are not in GNI, they're not do not showing evidence of human rights impact assessments and some basic things that that a commitment uh, to implement uh, the the UNGPs would would bring some evidence of. Um, so so it does seem that beyond GNI in the tech sort of in the ICT sector, um, I, I have seen a few other companies um, reference the UNGPs, like I think Cisco references them, um, but it's pretty limited. And I've got to say, you know, when I when I go to the Bay Area and find myself in in kind of techie conversations, like I was I was at a thing organized by the World Economic Forum and a bunch of people who kind of it was a discussion about advertising markets and and media and tech and so they were kind of a combination of media and tech and I brought up I I, I brought up not even the UN guiding principles the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and people barely knew what I was talking about um, so <laughs> um, yeah I mean in in Silicon Valley uh, UN human rights standards or global human rights standards like do not come to mind uh, for most companies, most of the time, they might think about First Amendment, Fourth Amendment, and et cetera, but they're, they're, they almost never think about global human rights standards, even if they're operating fairly globally, unless something has really caused them to to step out of that. I, I'm I'm finding, which is kind of. Uh, a little bit disturbing. Yeah, I was um, hoping this would be the panel to end on a positive note after uh, the two morning <laughs> panels did not, and yet, and um, yeah, and and just just to add something to there's there's another ranking um, organization called the Global Human Rights Benchmark that that evaluates a much you know they they evaluate oil and gas and mining companies and manufacturing uh, you know clothing and apparel companies, footwear and apparel companies, and and they're going to start to to look at. Um, ICT sector companies, not for digital rights issues, but for just their supply chain labor, kind of those human rights impacts. And it is my understanding, they, they haven't come out yet, but, but uh, apparently the ICT sector companies, in, in terms of their kind of implementation and reference to UN guiding principles, is much lower even than, say, the extractive sector. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Well, they've, they've faced litigation longer, the extractive sector. I don't know, maybe that's the answer. Okay. Um, but please join me in thanking our panel. Um, we now have a 15 minute break for those um, who are joining the workshop portion, we'll reconvene. Um, but I'd also like to thank Emily um, and her colleagues at the Law Review who made this possible and my partner, Ronell, in this, as well as those who've participated throughout the day. Um, thank you so very much. We look forward to continuing these conversations with you um, and we appreciate your time. Thank you. <laughs>